the recording, yes, thank you. So very welcome everybody to the fourth day of this uh, workshop on Marco Partitions and Young Towers. And we have uh, two very nice talks lined up. I think uh, so far all the talks have really been very interesting. It's been uh, for me at least, you know, so nice to hear all the talks so very connected to each other, really. This is why we decided to have such a focused workshop. So it's a great pleasure for me to, to introduce uh, the first speaker, Omri Sarig, uh, who is really uh, one, the, I would say, the pioneer of the development of Marco partitions in the non-uniformly hyperbolic setting, which is what we're focusing on. And he will uh, continue the topics talked about by Jérôme Bouzy and Sylvain Crovazier and talk about strong positive recurrence for diffeomorphism. Thank you very much, Henri. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the organizers for the initiative to hold this meeting and for give me, giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, everything that I'm going to say today is joined with uh, Jérôme Bouzy and Sylvain Crovazier. And in fact, it's a direct continuation of the two talks which they gave uh, earlier this week. So let me remind you that uh, Jerome and Sylvain proved two very useful properties for general uh, C infinity surface diffeomorphisms with positive topological entropy. Jerome proved the property called entropy continuity of Lyapunov exponents, and Sylvain proved the property called strong positive recurrence. I will recall what these properties are uh, later in the talk, so don't worry if you don't remember exactly what they mean. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to explain to you why these properties are useful. And I'm going to do it by presenting a variety of uh, consequences uh, which describe the stochastic behavior of the measure of maximal entropy. So everywhere in this talk, MME means uh, measure of maximal entropy. Now, there are going to be many, many consequences. And the best way to remember them concisely is that they all follow from a spectral gap for the transfer operator of the measure of maximal entropy. And that, in some sense, is the central uh, result of this talk that if you have a general C infinity uh, surface diffeomorphism with positive topological entropy, then uh, an ergodic measure of maximal entropy has a transfer operator which acts with spectral gap on some uh, Banach space. And as I'm sure many of you know, uh, this has uh, many, many consequences. Uh, since we're going to talk about uh, measures of maximal entropy, let me uh, begin by recalling some facts about them. So suppose uh, we have a closed smooth surface and uh, C infinity diffeomorphism on the surface with positive topological entropy. Well, then uh, the most fundamental result on measures of maximal entropy is that they exist. This is true, in fact, in any dimension, not just in dimension two. Uh, in dimension two, you also have uh, finiteness uh, properties. Uh, there, are all, there are at most finitely many uh, different ergodic measures of maximal entropy. And in a topologically transitive case, uh, exactly one. Since there is only one, it has to be ergodic. It's not always mixing, but uh, you can show that uh, every ergodic measure of maximal entropy is always isomorphic to the product of a Bernoulli scheme and a cyclic permutation of uh, p-points. Um, now, uh, there is a small uh, asterisk here because it, it's meant to remind me to tell you that uh, if you don't like the assumption of topological transitivity, then uh, you can remove it at the price of localizing to homoclinic classes. So everything that I say today is also going to work without assuming topological transitivity for the diffeomorphism, provided you focus all attention on one homoclinic class. On this homoclinic class, there is a unique measure of maximal entropy, uh, which is ergodic and in fact uh, Bernoulli up to a period. Now, what we're going to do today is to go beyond the ergodic theoretic uh, description of the measure and discuss uh, uh, the stochastic uh, properties of the measure. And uh, we're going to start with exponential decay of correlations. So the result uh, put briefly is that if you have a mixing measure of maximal entropy, then it exhibits exponential decay of correlations for Helder continuous uh, uh, functions. So uh, what I'm going to do next is to explain to you what you can say when you don't have mixing. Okay, so first of all, what are Helder continuous functions? These are real valued functions on the manifold. Uh, which have finite Helder norm. So beta, the parameter here, is the uh, Helder exponent. And the result is that uh, if you have a, a C infinity surface diffeomorphism with positive topological entropy, 
and you take energetic measure of maximal entropy, well, if it's mixing, then you have exponential decay of correlations for Helder continuous functions. If it's not mixing well, you can reduce to the mixing case by noting that uh, since the measure is isomorphic to a Bernoulli scheme times a permutation of P points, if you pass to the power P of the diffeomorphism, then the measure splits into a finite collection of ergodic components for F to the power P, each of which is mixing. And for these mixing ergodic components of F to the power P, you get a, a decay of correlations, exponential decay of correlations. For every uh, Helder continuous phi and psi, the covariance of psi at time zero and phi at time uh, NP uh, decays to zero exponentially fast. So that's exponential decay of correlations. Um, the next uh, results I would like to present are uh, belong to what's called in probability theory uh, invariance principles. These are results which say that um, a certain uh, uh, stochastic process looks like Brownian motion. So the stochastic process we're going to talk about is the stochastic process of Birkhoff sums. So let's think about the following procedure. Pick an initial condition randomly with respect to the measure of maximal entropy and calculate the ergodic sums at this initial condition at time one, two, three, and so on, up to time n. And I'll draw a graph of uh, the results. Again, I'm fixing the initial condition and I look at the value of the ergodic sums for this initial condition at times one, two, three, up to n. So let's draw a graph of this. This is a discrete graph because we're in discrete time. So let's turn it into a continuous graph by using linear interpolation. Then what we get is a zigzag line, okay? Now let's look at this line from far away. Formally, what I want to do, I want to scale. I want to divide the x-axis by n so that I get a function uh, on the unit interval, and I want to uh, scale the y-axis by square root of n because that's the right scaling in this business. And then the statement is that after the scaling or after zooming out, the random uh, zigzag line that you get from the Birkhoff sum, sums looks like the path of Brownian motion, okay? Now, of course, I have to tell you what exactly I mean by uh, look, uh, looks like, and there are several uh, non-equivalent ways of uh, saying it uh, in a precise way. Uh, we already saw one of these ways, the, the Donsker way in, uh, in the talk of uh, Carlos Mateus. I'm going to uh, state the Strassen way, the, what's called the, the strong invariance principle or the almost sure invariance principle. So uh, I will first give you the formal statement and then I will, I will comment on uh, what it means because if you see it for the first time, maybe it's not clear what it means. So here is the statement. Again, let's fix an ergodic measure of maximal entropy for a surface diffeomorphism, which is infinity. And let's fix some Helder continuous function. And I want to, this function to satisfy two conditions. The first condition is I want the integral to be zero. I want it to be centered. The second condition is I want my function not to be a measurable co-boundary. I don't want it to be cohomologous to a measurable co-boundary. And let psi n denote the, the ergodic sum at time n, okay? So now the formal statement is that you can construct another probability space equipped with two stochastic processes, Sn and Bt, so that Sn is equal in distribution to the process of Birkhoff sums. This means that if you look at a, a, a random graph of Sn and a random graph of Psi n, you cannot tell which one generated the graph only using the methods of statistics. The joint distribution is the same, okay? So Sn is going to be the same as our process of Birkhoff sums uh, in distribution. The second pro uh, process, Bt, is going to be standard Brownian motion. So a process which at time zero is equal to zero and has Gaussian independent increments, okay? Now, since these two processes are defined on the same probability space, I can, I can ask about the distance between the two. And the statement, the important statement is that uh, Sn is equal to Bn up to a constant sigma plus a negligible error. And this is true almost surely, okay? Negligible in this business means much smaller than the uh, square root of n. So here the power lambda is uh, smaller than one half. So probabilists uh, say that what, what we are doing here is we take the original stochastic process of Birkhoff sums, okay? What you get from the Birkhoff sums when you choose the initial condition randomly with respect to the measure of maximal entropy. So we take this process and we couple it to Brownian motion in such a way that the distance between the two is negligible, okay? 
The reason I need to pass to another probability space is that in general, the Birkhoff sums are a sequence of functions on my original surface. And Brownian motion is defined where Brownian motion is defined on Wiener space. So I can't talk about their difference because they are defined on different spaces. But what, is, uh, what the almost true invariance principle allows you to do is to define a copy of the original process on the sample space of Brownian motion so that you can actually uh, write an equation relating the two. That's the idea of, of coupling. Okay, intuitively what this means is that uh, you can uh, uh, define your process on a probability space which has Brownian motion so that the random graph of your process is within negligible error from a random graph of the, of, of the Wiener process of the Brownian motion. Okay, so this is the, uh, the strong invariance principle, the almost sure invariance principle, and uh, let's discuss some consequences of this. Well, the first consequence is the central limit theorem. The, the almost sure invariance principle is about the distribution of the entire graph of the function. The central limit theorem is a statement about the end of the graph, okay? The value at time n. It says that the distribution of the value at time n, let's say this bar chart, converges in distribution to the distribution of the endpoint of the Brownian path, which is precisely a Gaussian by the, by the, virt by the nature of uh, the, the Wiener process. So here is the statement. Again, you have an ergodic measure of maximal entropy for a C-infinity surface diffeomorphism. You have a Helder continuous function with the zero integral, and you assume that the function is not a measurable co-boundary. Then the statement is that you have the central limit theorem. There exists a sigma, which is positive, so that the measure of the set of initial conditions where the Birkhoff sum after scaling uh, is between A and B, well, that's approximately what, Brownian, what uh, the normal distribution tells you. Uh, there is also a formula for the, the asymptotic variance, this parameter that appears here. Uh, it's, uh, this formula is called the Green-Kubo formula. It, it uh, presents the asymptotic variance as the variance of Psi, which is what you would have uh, gotten had Psi of Fi been independent. But since they're not independent, there needs to be a correction, and this is this term. This is the Green-Kubo correction, which takes into account the correlation between Psi and Psi. Another uh, identity, useful identity for sigma squared is uh, this second derivative of the pressure. Um, this is useful because you could, then you can use the methods of uh, thermodynamic formalism to see that sigma squared is zero if and only if psi is a measurable co-boundary. This is why I need this uh, additional condition to have sigma different from zero. And you get it from this formula for the linear response. Okay, the next consequence of the almost sure invariance principle is the law of the iterated logarithm. So uh, what you see in this picture are many, many graphs of Birkhoff sums, but started at different initial conditions. So each, each initial condition gives you another uh, uh, zigzag line. And the law of the iterated logarithm says that uh, with full probability, these lines tend to stand within an envelope depicted here in, in black, okay? And the law of the iterated logarithm identifies the form of this envelope. And it says that it's the graph of uh, square root of two x log log x. Okay, um, so here is the statement. Uh, again, you have an ergodic measure of maximal entropy for a C-infinity surface diffeomorphism with positive entropy. And we have a Helder continuous function with zero integral, which is not a co-boundary. Then the law of the literate logarithm says that the precise rate of growth of the Birkhoff sums of Psi is, is what's written here. Okay, it's 2n log log n up to, up to a constant, which is this uh, sigma that we discussed before. This is an optimal bound because the limb soup of the quotient is equal to plus one almost surely and equal to minus one almost surely when you look at the limits, okay? So the, the uh, formula in the red gives you the top half of the envelope, the formula in black gives you the, 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 the bottom one, okay? So you have one part of the envelope and uh, another part of the envelope and these are, they are optimal, okay? They are optimal, it's a limb soup and a limb inf. If I change slightly the constant sigma, the statements are no longer valid. Okay, they are violated. Okay, uh, why does this follow from the almost sure invariance principle? Well, basically because this statement is, uh, is a classical result for Brownian motion. And since our process is equal to Brownian motion up to an error which is much smaller than square root of n, well, it's also much smaller than square root of n log log n. Therefore, you get this result from uh, classical results uh, uh, for Brownian motion. Okay, um, there are many other consequences of uh, the almost true invariance principle like the arc sine law and uh, uh, Strassen's law of the iterated logarithm and many other results, the, the law of records. 
uh, but uh, instead of discussing them, I want to, to, to focus on something else. So, so far I've stated the results for Helder continuous functions Psi. But as you will see in a short while, the way that we prove these results is by passing to a symbolic model. And in order to prove these results, we don't really need the function to be Helder continuous. It is sufficient for our purposes that the coding of the function on the symbolic model is Helder continuous. Okay, let me say this again. We don't need the function of the manifold to be Helder continuous. It's sufficient for us that the lift of the function to the symbolic model be Helder continuous. Now, because the symbolic model is totally disconnected, it's much easier to be continuous or regular or Helder continuous on the symbolic model than on the connected manifold below. And as a result, there are many functions which are not Helder continuous on the manifold, which nevertheless have a Helder continuous coding on the symbolic space. Specifically, certain passing sets have indicator functions which are coded by indicators of cylinders. So although they are not Helder continuous on the manifold because they're equal to either zero or one, they are, they are Helder continuous on the symbolic model. Similarly, the geometric potential, the logarithm of the unstable Jacobian, this is not a Helder continuous or even globally defined uh, function below on the manifold, but if you do your coding correctly, it has a Helder continuous coding above. Okay, now when you apply um, uh, the result I stated before to these discontinuous functions on the manifold by applying them to the, the continuous codings on the symbolic model, you get consequences, uh, passing theoretic consequences, which I think are interesting and I would like to show you uh, what they are. The proofs are immediate, okay, there is much, nothing much to do uh, to prove them. They, they are really special cases of the previous results interpreted correctly, but uh, still I would like to show them to you because I think they are interesting. So uh, uh, the first uh, result relates to uh, passing sets. So let me remind you that uh, a passing set is a closed set uh, where the dynamics is uniformly hyperbolic. It is specified by uh, three constants, k, epsilon, and chi. Uh, and the uh, uniform hyperbolicity is expressed by saying that every point in the passing set uh, has a well-defined stable and unstable direction. And you have a uniform contraction uh, in st on stable spaces in the future and on unstable spaces in the past. Now the parameter chi is the one that gives you the rate of exponential decay. Uh, and the parameter uh, epsilon tells you how these bounds deteriorate when you pass from x to f to the power k of x. Okay, so chi is the parameter of contraction in the stable and unstable directions. Epsilon is the control on how the bounds deteriorate when you pass from x to another point on the orbit of x. Okay, I should mention that part of the definition also is that you have a lower bound on the angle. Okay, so this is a passing set and the union of all passing sets, you know, for all k uh, is a set of full measure by the that it's theorem. Um, of course, these sets are not necessarily invariant sets. And because of this, if you start from a, a point in passing set and you iterate it, it's possible that the point uh, comes out, okay? And spends a very long time outside. Now, the time that the point in the passing set spends outside the passing set is unbounded in principle. Um, uh, but we can ask, you know, how big is the time that you spend outside the passing set for most points, okay? And the way to do it is to define a function, the, which is called the entrance time to a passing set, which tells you how much time you need to wait uh, before your orbit hits the passing set, okay? So this function is uh, finite almost surely, okay, by uh, Poincare recurrence, by ergodicity, uh, but it's not bounded. And the question is, well, how big is the set of points for which this function is big? But the answer is it's exponentially small. So if you have uh, an ergodic measure of maximal entropy, for a surface diffeomorphism, C infinity, then the measure of the set of initial conditions, which require more than n iterates to enter a passing set, it decays exponentially in n, okay? How do you prove it? Very easily. You take the indicator of a passing set, which you choose carefully so that its indicator has a Helder continuous coding above, and you use exponential mixing, okay? It follows from exponential decay of correlations for a suitable choice of a passing set. Okay, another question you can ask, I'm sorry? I have a question. Yes, so go ahead. Does the constant theta depend on epsilon from the passing set? Yes. Yes, it does. When you take epsilon to zero, it goes to one? What goes to one? When theta goes to one, when epsilon goes to zero? Um, oh, oh, you're asking, you're asking whether theta depends on epsilon. Yeah. Um, 
let me think. No, I, I, I can't say anything about the dependence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the best I can say is that that tends to one. Yeah, yeah I, I, cannot, I cannot say anything. Uh, okay. uh, so another question? Okay, next thing, let's discuss the optimal passing constant. So what is the optimal passing constant? Uh, by the oscillated theorem for almost every point X, there exists a constant KX, which satisfies these bounds, okay? Um, let's look at the smallest possible constant which satisfies this bound. It's, it's, it exists and it's called the optimal passing constant. And the way that I define it, it's automatically temperable in the sense of passing, the, it deteriorates in a controlled way uh, uh, along iterations. If you're uniformly hyperbolic and also, then the optimal passing constant is uniformly bounded. If you're not uniformly hyperbolic, then the passing constant is finite almost truly, but it's not uniformly bounded. Again, you can ask how big is the set of points where the optimal passing constant is big? Well, the answer is it's small, okay? It's exponentially small. So here's the result. Uh, if you look at the set of points such that the logarithm of the optimal passing constant is bigger than N, it decays exponentially in N, okay? And again, it depends on uh, epsilon and chi. Uh, what's the proof of this? Again, it's very easy because the optimal passing constant is tempered if the log of the optimal passing constant is big, is big at time zero, then it will take you a very long time to return to a passing set where the optimal passing constant is, let's say, less than five, because the optimal passing constant varies by, by steps of e to the epsilon along iterates. So the event that the optimal passing constant is big is a subset of the event that the entrance time to, the passing, to some passing set is big. Okay, so again, the proof is very easy. It follows from previous results. Okay, next let me show you a couple of consequences which you obtain when you look at the, uh, the geometric potential, okay? And these consequences uh, are related to statements on the rate of expansion on unstable directions. So uh, let's see what happens when we simply write down the consequence of the law of the iterated logarithm, okay? So again, let's assume that M0 is an ergodic MME of the infinity surface diffeomorphism. And let's make the following assumption. Uh, there are two hyperbolic periodic orbits which are homoclinically related to M0, but have different top Lyapunov exponents. This assumption is sufficient to uh, guarantee that the geometric potential is not a measurable co-boundary, okay? By the, by the uh, Lipschitz theorem for non-uniform hyperbolic uh, 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 dynamical systems uh, due to uh, Katok, Mendoza, and the uh, polycot. Okay, well, uh, in this case, we are, uh, the, the geometric potential is not a co-boundary, so the law of the iterated logarithm applies, and it gives you this inequality. It says that uh, uh, for almost every x, uh, for, n, for n sufficiently big, for all n sufficiently big, uh, the uh, expansion of f to the power n on the unstable uh, direction satisfies these bounds. Okay, moreover, these bounds are sharp. Okay, if you slightly decrease sigma, then the upper bound will be violated infinitely many times and the lower bound will be violated uh, infinitely many times. Okay, so this gives you, if you want, an almost true rate of convergence in the limit which defines the Lyapunov exponent. And it has the interesting consequence that uh, uh, there are, uh, almost surely there are infinitely many times when you see super exponential expansion and there are also uh, um, infinitely many times where the rate of exponential expansion that you see is smaller than what it should be. Omri, this almost everywhere is for the measure of maximum entropy. Always right? for, the, for the measure of maximum entropy. Everything that I'm going to say now is for, for the measure of maximum entropy. That's right. Again, this follows immediately by applying the law of the iterated logarithm for the geometric potential. The last result I would like to mention doesn't, doesn't follow from the almost sure invariance principle, it follows from something else. It's related to the property of um, uh, entropy continuity, which uh, Jerome uh, uh, mentioned uh, in his talk. It's a result on the stability of measures of maximal entropy. And before I state you, uh, before I give you the precise statement, let me tell you roughly what I'm trying to say. What I want to say is that if you take, an, if you take a measure which is not the measure of maximal entropy, but has nearly maximal entropy, okay, its entropy is nearly maximal, then I want to say that this measure is very close to the measure of maximal entropy in, in, a, in a precise sense. So again, I'm, I'm going to give you a statement that says that if a measure has nearly maximal entropy, then the measure has to be close to the measure of maximal entropy. So here is how to say this. Uh, now I'm going to assume topological transitivity or I'm going to stick to a homoclinic class. 
uh, now it's going to matter. So here's what, what I want to say. Uh, you can find a, a constant C beta uh, so that the following inequality holds. Suppose you have a measure, invariant measure M, such that the entropy of M is epsilon close to the, to the maximal entropy. Then I claim that the measure M is square root of epsilon close to the measure of maximal entropy in the sense that if you evaluate M and M zero on the Helder continuous function Psi, the results are square root of epsilon close. So again, you start with any measure M and you assume that its entropy is epsilon close to the maximum. The statement is that in this case, the measure is square root of epsilon close to the measure of maximal entropy, where distance is measured by comparing the uh, integrals of Helder continuous test functions, okay? So that's closeness of the measures. There is also closeness of the Lyapunov exponents. Uh, if you have a measure whose entropy is nearly the maximal entropy, then the Lyapunov exponents are close up to square root of epsilon. Okay. Uh, are you, Amri, are you assuming the measures are ergodic? No, or anyone? no, I, oh, no, oh, no, okay. Anyone, huh? anyone. And I'm assuming okay. that M0 is ergodic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming that M0 is ergodic. Um, you see this, the, the, the expressions here are fine. So I can, I can integrate them on, uh, on all ergodic components. That's why I don't need the ergodicity. Um, uh, okay, so for an of diffeomorphisms, these results are known. They are due to uh, Shirali Kadyrov. Uh, he proved them for subsets of finite type and they follow by uh, the existence of a finite Markov partition from his results on subshifts of finite type. Uh, for countable Markov shifts, which, are, which satisfy a condition called SPR, which I will mention in, in, in a short while, uh, these results are due to René Roux and uh, me. Okay, so uh, there are many other... The, uh, oh, Omri, yeah. what about... I'm sorry, Asha, your internet is not clear. I, I, it, what about isolated decompositions? The stable, sub, um, stable subspaces in your case, are they close? You, you, ah, you, you say I, closeness I, of Lyapunov exponent. Yes. What about closeness of the subspaces, isolated subspaces? Um, they are also close because in, in my coding, the oscillated spaces depend in the Helder continuous way on the point on the, in the symbolic space. So yes, they will also be close. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it's also true for our codings that the oscillated directions are held or continuous in the, in the coding of the point, so it will follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, the other results uh, um, uh, you can get from spectral gap, I don't have time to, to mention all of them, uh, because what I want to do is I want to, to use the remaining time to say something about the proof. Okay, so I'd like to emphasize everything I had said uh, so far is known for an of diffeomorphisms. Okay, so there is nothing new mm -hmm. here for an of diffeomorphisms. Then the novelty is that I'm not assuming uniform hyperbolicity. I'm only assuming a C infinity and two dimensionality. So the question is how to obtain these consequences without assuming uniform hyperbolicity. Now, um, Everybody that worked with the stochastic properties of dynamical systems knows that the way to get the statements I, I, I mentioned before, the way to do it is to prove that the transfer operator has spectral gap on some Banach space, okay? This is, a, a, if you know that the transfer operator of the measure of maximal entropy expect, acts with spectral gap on some Banach space, then there are well-known, highly sophisticated tools that were developed over the last 50 years. Uh, which allow you to deduce uh, everything that I said, okay? These results were, these tools are collectively known under the name of the transfer operator method and they were developed by many people. Uh, for example, uh, Ruel, uh, Pari, Polycott, Sharp, uh, Givarsh and Hardy, Rousseau, Egel, uh, Sebastian Guezel, for example, for the almost sure invariance principle uh, and many other people. So uh, really the question is how to get spectral gap. Okay, if you don't know exactly what I mean by spectral gap, don't worry, I'm going to, to explain later on. Now, uh, in their talks, uh, Jerome showed that uh, every C infinity surface diffeomorphism uh, with positive topological entropy has the property he called entropy continuity of Lyapunov exponents. Uh, 
That's the property that says that if a sequence of measures converge, has entropies which converge to the maximal entropy, then the, Lyap then the measures and the Lyapunov of exponents of the measures converge to those of the measure of maximal entropy. Okay, this, this Jerome showed always holds for C infinity surface diffeomorphisms. And then Silvan in his talk showed that this property implies a strong positive recurrence, a property that I will uh, recall uh, later on. What I'm going to do now is explain to you why strong positive recurrence implies spectral gap for the transfer operator. And once I do this, uh, we get a proof because as I said before, to see that spectral gap implies the results I mentioned before is, uh, is, is well known, okay? It's, it's the transfer operator method and, uh, and nothing else. So we are going to focus now on uh, the implication written here in red, that the strong positive recurrence property introduced in Sylvain's talk uh, implies a spectral gap for the transfer operator. Okay. So um, uh, how to do this? How to show that the uh, strong positive recurrence implies a uh, spectral gap? Okay, so let me begin with um, um, just uh, recalling some facts on symbolic dynamics after Yuri Lima's mini course. Uh, uh, I mean, it was discussed at length there. I will only say it briefly. Uh, suppose you have a C1 epsilon uh, diffeomorphism. Now, now we can work in any dimension. Uh, then I proved in dimension two and uh, Sneer Ben Ovadia proved in uh, any dimension that you can construct a countable Markov shift and an equivariant Helder continuous map pi from the countable Markov shift to the manifold so that this diagram here commutes. Okay, the, the action of the shift uh, on the symbolic space commutes with the action of the diffeomorphism on the surface. Okay, now this coding map has two important uh, technical properties. It is almost surely finite to one and it is almost surely on two. Specifically, what I mean is the following, that you can define a very big subset of the shift, sigma sharp, which is huge. It contains the non-wandering set. In particular, it has full measure for all shift invariant measures. And when you restrict the coding map to this huge set, you get a finite to one map. Further, the image of the coding map on this huge set has full measure for all ergodic invariant hyperbolic measures whose Lyapunov exponents are bounded away from zero by chi. Now, the significance of uh, finiteness to one and uh, almost, uh, almost every surjectivity is that it means that uh, if you have an, in, an invariant measure on the shift, it projects to an invariant measure with the same entropy below. And if you have an ergodic invariant chi hyperbolic measure below, it lifts, it has a lift to a, a measure above with the same entropy, okay? So I, I'm going to, I, I emphasize that when you move from, when you lift a measure below to a measure above, and when you project a measure above to a measure below, the entropy remains the same. That, that's what's crucial here. And this is because of finiteness to one. Okay, and that will be important for us. Uh, I studied this result for diffeomorphisms, but by now there are, there are many, many uh, generalizations to, to other dynamical systems. Uh, these were explained in, uh, in Yuri's, uh, Yuri's talk. There are now results for maps with singularities, for flows, for maps in higher dimension, even for non-invertible maps. Uh, there are also improvements of the almost sure injectivity and almost sure surjectivity statements. Uh, Boyle and Bouzy have an almost sure one-to-one -one, uh, injective coding for, uh, when you fix the measure. Uh, Snir ben has a coding for which you can actually calculate the image uh, precisely, identify the set. Uh, for us, uh, uh, it will be important that you can strengthen the coding in the following sense. If you only code a homoclinic class, you can get a transitive coding. You can make the countable Markov shift topologically transitive. This will be important to us. Uh, why is it going to be important to us? Because of the following reason. Imagine that either the, the diffeomorphism is topologically transitive in dimension two, or that, or that you are only looking at a homoclinic class. Then by the strengthening I mentioned before, you can make the coding with the topologically transitive countable Markov shift. Now, why is this good? It's good because let's see what, let's see what happens when we, when we code the measure of maximal entropy, okay? Uh, first of all, the measure of maximal entropy is unique by topological transitivity. So let's take the measure of maximal entropy mu and let's lift it to a measure on the countable Markov shift. Because the coding is finite to one, uh, the measure above has the same entropy as the measure below. I claim that the lift is the measure of maximum entropy above. Why? 
First of all, it has the entropy of the measure below. Secondly, there cannot be any measure above with bigger entropy because such a measure would have projected to a measure with bigger entropy below and we started with the measure of maximal entropy. So for this reason, if you start with the measure of maximal entropy below, then the lift is the measure of maximal entropy above. And what's nice about transitive countable Markov shifts is that we have a formula for the measure of maximal entropy above. We, we have an explicit formula, okay? Uh, this formula was found for subject finite type by uh, Bill Parry and was extended to the countable state uh, case by uh, Boris Gurevich. It says that uh, uh, the measure of maximal entropy above is a Markov measure and there is a formula for the matrix of transition probabilities, okay? I'm not going to repeat the formula, uh, although it's known completely. Uh, I'll just say that the matrix of uh, transition probabilities for this Markov chain is conjugate to the transition matrix of the graph up to a constant. Okay. So you, uh, so Omri, this uh, the the bound is uniform, I guess, right? It's not just finite to one at points be by some simple argument. Uh, you mean the bound of the coding? So finite to one could mean for each point there's a finite pre-image, okay, but yeah. for so, almost so, all points it's the same, right? Right, right, because it's an the number of pre-images okay. in is an invariant function. That's right. Good. Okay. That's right, yeah. But uh, for different measures, it could be different. For different ergodic measures, this, this bound could be different. But for okay, the measure of maximal you. entropy, but for each, each individual ergodic measure, it's a, it's a constant. Oh, thank you, right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's summarize. If we code a diffeomorphism by a transitive countable Markov shift, then the measure of maximal entropy uh, of, of the diffeomorphism is coded by a Markov chain whose transition matrix is known, it's basically conjugate up to a constant to the transition matrix of the graph. And now, you know, when you have a Markov chain, you can ask, okay, what do I need to know about this Markov chain to prove that it has exponential decay of correlations or to prove that it has uh, satisfied the central limit theorem or the almost sure invariance principle? Well, basically what you need, you need to know that it satisfies the spectral gap property. So you need to know that the transition matrix of the, uh, the matrix of transition probabilities or basically the transition matrix of the graph, you need to know that it has a, a certain property called the spectral gap property, which I will now, uh, uh, now describe. So what is the spectral gap property of the transition matrix that uh, guarantees exponential decay of correlations, uh, invariance principle and so on. Uh, so uh, here it is. So let's begin with some notation. So suppose we have a countable directed graph and let's assume for simplicity that every vertex has a finite degree, okay? Not bounded, but finite. Let T denote the matrix of zeros and ones which encodes the, the, the collection of edges. So a pair AB uh, will have entry equal to one if there is an edge from A to B and it will have, uh, the entry will be equal to zero if there is no edge from A to B. This is a, a matrix of uh, zeros and ones and it's an infinite matrix because my graph is infinite. So now I need to be careful because uh, an infinite matrix can act in many different ways on many different uh, vector spaces. Uh, so let me tell you which action I'm going to, to study. So I'm going to uh, study the action on the space of uh, continuous functions on the one-sided shift, okay? So the one-sided shift is the collection of all one-sided paths on the graph. And I will look at the collection of all continuous functions, bounded continuous functions on this uh, space. And I'm going to let the transition matrix act on them using the Ruel operator action. So what, what does the Ruel operator do? You take a function of one-sided paths and you map it to the function LF so that LF on a path is the sum of the value of F on all possible extensions of the path one, one step to the left, okay? So I, I, if I want to calculate the action of my matrix on my function F, it's a function and the value of this function at the one-sided path is given by this formula. It's a sum of the values of the function on all paths, which are predecessors of the path I started from. Why is this an action of the transition matrix? Because it's the transition matrix that tells you which extensions to the left you are allowed to put, okay? So this is an action. And the spectral gap property is a property of this action, okay? It says roughly, that there exists a Banach space such that L acts on this Banach space with the good spectral properties. Here are the spectral properties. 
What I want is to be able to construct a Banach space of functions on the one side of the shift so that uh, uh, the space is big. It contains the indicators of cylinder sets. The norm is strong. Uh, norm convergence implies uniform convergence on cylinders, on partition sets. Uh, I want my operator, my action to be bounded, to be continuous, and I want it to have a finite norm. And most importantly, I want the spectrum to consist of a simple eigenvalue uh, at e to the entropy plus possibly a subset of a strictly smaller disk. This is called spectral gap because of the gap between the uh, leading eigenvalue and the rest of the spectrum, uh, the gamma, gamma here, okay? Uh, next, I want some other uh, function, uh, uh, functional analytic properties, which I'm not going to use in this talk. So I just mentioned them to have a complete definition. I want the norm to be a Banach algebra norm. I want to have the lattice property. I want the, the uh, uh, absolute value to be a, a continuous uh, nonlinear map. And I want uh, a multiplication by Helder bounded Helder continuous functions to preserve the space in a bounded way. Okay, so uh, the spectral gap property of the transition matrix is that there exists a Banach space of one-sided functions which satisfies this list of axioms, this list of requirements, okay? And now the question is, well, <clears throat> how to know whether such a Banach space exists? Well, first let's ask, does it always exist? The answer is no. Uh, there are some matrices, infinite matrices of zeros and ones, which do not act with spectral gap on some Banach space of one-sided functions. Uh, I have here a, a a diagram on which, which indicates uh, some well-known examples of countable Markov shifts for which such spaces exist. That's, these are those. But the, uh, and there are also some well-known examples of uh, uh, countable Markov shifts for which such spaces do not exist, okay? Um, uh, for people in this conference, let me say that if you have a young tower, such that the tail of the return, the return time function is exponential, then such a space exists. That's a result of Lysang Yang. But if the return time has polynomial uh, uh, tail, then such a space cannot exist because spectral gap implies exponential decay of correlations, whereas exponential decay, is, whereas polynomial decay uh, implies non exponential decay of correlations. Okay, so uh, there are okay, some young question. towers. Sorry? So when you say young tower, you mean young tower with respect to the measure of maximal entropy having uh, exponential I mean, tails? I mean, uh, uh, the tower itself as a system with a countable Markov partition. But exp having exponential tails is with respect to the measure to, of maximal entropy. That's right, that's right, exactly, okay. exactly. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, so since there are some countable Markov shifts for which such spaces exist, and there are some countable Markov shifts for, for which such spaces cannot exist, uh, we face a problem, which is how to decide whether a given matrix of zeros and ones uh, admits a Banach space with all those properties, okay? It, this question is completely understood in the framework of abstract uh, countable Markov shifts. Uh, so there is a necessary and sufficient condition. Let me briefly explain it. Uh, it's best understood in terms of uh, combinatorial features of the graph, okay? So consider the graph associated to the countable Markov shift. And uh, given a vertex A, let's look at the collection of all paths, admissible paths of length N from A to A, or all loops from A to A, okay? Let's count how many such loops exist, and let's call the, the result of the count Zn, okay? Now, let's count how many first return loops there are at the vertex A. So how many paths from A to A exist, which do not visit A in the middle? Let's count them and call the result of the count Zn star. Okay, obviously Zn star is less than or equal to Zn. It turns out that the spectral gap property holds if and only if Zn is not just larger, but exponentially larger than Zn star. So here's the result. It's the, the result of works by, by, by many people. Uh, if you have a, a topologically transitive countable Markov shift with finite Gorevich entropy, so the supremum of the metric entropies is finite, then you have the following three equivalent properties. First property, spectral gap property. So the property that there exists a Banach space with all the properties I listed before, okay? So this property is equivalent to the following two properties. 
first property, what I said before, that there are exponentially more loops than first return loops at some vertex. It doesn't matter which. If this happens for one vertex, it happens for all vertices, okay? Third property, the entropy at infinity, something that which I will define in a minute, is strictly smaller than the supremum of all, of all entropies. Okay, so these three properties are equivalent. A bit of history of this, um, the fact that the spectral gap property, the existence of a Banach space, the fact that one implies two is due to David Veer Jones. The fact that two implies one is due to Van Seer and me. The fact that uh, two implies three is due to Gorevich and Zargaryan. The fact that uh, three implies two is due to Silvirouet. Okay, but uh, for us, what's important is that the three properties uh, are equivalent. So one quick question: yeah. uh, If you look, if you the, the classical notion, like in Sonetta's book and so on, is this uh, positive recurrence for the mm -hmm. shift? Is is this the same as that or stronger? It's stronger. So okay. uh, the, the way to think about it is the following: uh, a, a Markov chain is positive recurrent. If when you start at the vertex A, um, you return to A and the time you need to wait has finite expectation. Uh -huh. Okay. A, a, a Markov chain is strongly positively recurrent. If not only do you have, you return with the finite expected time, the, the, the return time has exponential tail. Ah, good. Thank you. That's, that's a stronger requirement. One says that you are in L1, the other one says much more. Um, okay, for Markov chains, a uh, strong positive recurrence is uh, basically the statement that uh, you're exponentially mixing on cylinders. Oh, good, thank you. Not just, not just mixing. Right. Okay, uh, so we have three equivalent properties. Uh, perhaps the third one is a bit mysterious because it has this strange notation here, lim soup as the measure tends to infinity. So what do I mean by this? Uh, let me explain this. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple thing. Uh, just to make my life easy, I'm going to explain it only for countable Markov shifts where every vertex has, has a finite degree, okay? So I'm going to say that the sequence of measures escapes to infinity if for every pre-compact set, eventually most of the mass is going to be outside the compact set, okay? So for every epsilon, for every pre-compact measurable set B, there exists a time capital N after which the measure of B is less than epsilon. So most of the mass escapes every pre-compact set, every, every measurable pre-compact set, okay? So that, that's what I mean when I say that the sequence of measures escapes to infinity. Now, what do I mean when I, when I write down lim soup of the entropy as the measure tends to infinity? What I mean is the supremum over the lim soup over all possible sequences which escape to infinity, okay? So I look at the all, sequences of measures which escape to infinity. I calculate the limb soup of the entropies along this, uh, this sequence, and then I take a supremum of all possible sequences. That's what I mean by limb soup of uh, the entropy. And what I just told you is that the spectral gap property, the property that there exists a Banach space on which the transition matrix acts with the spectral gap, with all the properties I mentioned before, is equivalent to the statement that the entropy at infinity, the limb soup of the entropy along all sequences which tend to infinity is bounded away from the Gurevich entropy, the supremum of, over all metric entropies, okay? Any questions about this, what this means? Please ask verbally if you send me things in chat, I can't see it. Okay, so uh, at this point, I would like to tell you that this entropy at infinity uh, uh, was considered by other authors in different contexts. Uh, for example, by uh, Jean Bouzy and Sylvie Rouet, uh, they used it to uh, construct uh, measures of maximal entropy for CR interval maps. Uh, it appears in a series of papers by uh, Godofredo Yomi, Mike Todd, and Anibal Velozzo on upper semi-continuity of the entropy uh, map on countable Markov shifts. Uh, it was used uh, in number theory, uh, in proofs of Duke's theorem. Uh, for, for instance, in this famous paper by Ansi Linen Strauss, Michel, and Venkatesh. Uh, it's used in uh, variable curvature as well. Uh, uh, by, uh, there are papers by uh, Pete and Shapira, uh, Guezel, Nu Shapira, Tapi, and Rikelm on uh, geodesic flows on non-compact uh, manifolds uh, with the uh, variable negative curvature. 
And I also like to say that if you think about the entropy at infinity as the complexity of bad things, and think of this inequality as saying that the complexity of bad things is smaller than the complexity of the system, then it's very similar to uh, uh, results appearing in the work of uh, Von Klimenaga and Dan Thompson on uh, uh, generalized specification properties of uh, dynamical systems. It's, it's in the same flavor. The, the infinity is bad. Soon you will see why I think that infinity is bad. And uh, this, is, this is basically saying that the complexity of the system close to the bad part of phase space is smaller than the full complexity of the system. That, that's, a bad way, uh, that's a good way to think about uh, this condition. Okay, so now let's move back to how much time do I have? Ah, I'm short of time. Now let's move back to uh, diffeomorphisms on manifolds and uh, uh, see how to interpret the entropy at infinity on the level of the manifold. Uh, okay, so first of all, I can't use the same definition of entropy at infinity on the manifold because the manifold is itself is compact. So no sequence of measures can escape to infinity on a compact manifold, simply because the manifold itself is, is compact. I need to use a more, a more a, a subtle and sophisticated notion of escape to infinity. Now to define this notion, I'm going to use some abstract nonsense. I'm going to use the, the notion of bornology, which is a, a general way of defining escape to infinity on uh, abstract spaces. So what is a bornology? A bornology is a collection of sets which we call bounded, which satisfy natural axioms. For example, uh, the axioms are that every point is bounded, a finite unit of bounded sets is bounded, a subset of a bounded set is bounded, and every bounded set is a subset of a measurable bounded set. Okay, so these are natural axioms. Um, We're going to say that a sequence of measures escapes to infinity with respect to a bornology if for every epsilon, most of the mass is outside every bounded set. Okay, so for every bounded measurable set B, for every epsilon, there exists a position index sequence whence forth the measure of the bounded set is less than epsilon. Okay, so you saw an example, pre-compact set, the bornology of pre-compact sets on a countable Markov shift. But now I want to define a bornology on the non-uniformly hyperbolic part of a manifold. Okay, so I'm going to look at the set of Lyapunov regular points with Lyapunov exponents bounded away from zero. That's a horrible Borel set. It has em perhaps empty interior, okay? Uh, uh, so on this highly non-compact set, I'm going to define a Bornology by appealing to the collection of passing sets. I'm going to fix two parameters, chi and epsilon, and I'm going to look at the passing sets with these parameters. And I'm going to say that the set is bounded if it's included in the passing set, okay? I remind you that uh, the parameters chi and epsilon have this meaning. Chi tells you the rate of contraction on the stable and unstable uh, directions. And epsilon gives you the control on how the bounds deteriorate when you iterate the, the point, okay? So if you fix chi and epsilon, you, have, uh, you get a collection of passing sets defined with these parameters. And I'm going to use the, the bornology of all subsets of these passing sets, okay? So escape to infinity in the passing bornology means that most of the mass escapes to regions in the space where hyperbolicity is very, very bad, okay? The, these, these, these bounds uh, happen with huge constancy, okay? That's what, what it means. And now I'm going to talk about escape to infinity with respect to this passing bornology. So now let me recall what was the strong positive recurrence property in Sylvain's talk. It's, uh, Sylvain gave several uh, equivalent conditions. One of them was this one, or, or at least it's equivalent in my notation to this one that there exists a parameter chi such that for all epsilon small, the limb soup of the entropy at infinity with respect to the passing bornology is strictly smaller than the topological entropy of the system. In other words, every sequence of measures which escapes to infinity in the passing bornology in the sense that most of the mass moves to parts of the space where the passing constant is huge. Uh, if you have a sequence of measures like this, then its entropy has to be bounded away from, uh, from the to full topological entropy. This is why I said that entropy at infinity measures bad behavior because it measures the complexity of measures which are concentrated in the part of phase space where the uh, hyperbolicity bounds are very, very bad. They, they require huge optimal passing constant. Okay, so now here is our situation. Um, Jerome and Sylvain basically showed that if you have a general C infinity surface diffeomorphism, then the entropy at infinity is going to be 
smaller than the full topological entropy, if you think of entropy at infinity, uh, using the perspective of the Pessin bonology, es escaping Pessin sets. And I, in this talk, recalled uh, a, a result by Vir Jones, Sir and me, Rouet, Gorevich and Zargarian, which together showed that uh, the condition that the entropy at infinity with respect to the bonology of pre-compact sets, the condition that this entropy at infinity is smaller than the full topological entropy is equivalent to the existence of a Banach space on which the transition matrix acts with spectral gap, okay? So the entropy at infinity appears on the left and it appears on the right. The only difference is that it uses different bonologies. Here we talk about measures on the manifold and we use escape to infinity in the sense of escaping passing sets. Here we use measures on symbolic space and we use escape to infinity in the sense of escaping pre-compact sets on symbolic space. And the question of course is whether these uh, bonologies are compatible, okay? What we really need to be able to pass from this condition, which we already have because of the work of Jerome and Silvani in their talks, what we need to pass from this condition to, to this condition that will give a spectral gap is to know that if you have a sequence that the, uh, uh, you have the following compatibility between the bonology of pre-compact sets in symbolic space and the bonology of passing sets below in the sense that if you have a sequence that escapes to infinity above in the sense that it escapes every pre-compact set, then its projection to the manifold escapes to infinity in the sense of escaping every passing set. That's what we want to know. We want to know that if you have a sequence above which escapes to infinity in the sense of the bonology of pre-compact sets, then it projects to a sequence which escapes to infinity in the sense of passing sets. And of course, this depends on the coding. And the technical uh, lemma in this talk is that there is a coding for which this is true, okay? There is a symbolic coding of a surface diffeomorphism, which is finite to one and almost sure, surely uh, surjective, which satisfies this strange set theoretic uh, inclusion which I would like to ask you not to read, okay? What I would like you to read is the implication of this inclusion. And the implication of this inclusion is that if you have a sequence of measures on symbolic space, which escapes to infinity above, then it projects to a sequence of measures on the manifold, which escapes to infinity with respect to the passing bonology. That's what this inclusion implies. And that's what you get. And that's the compatibility of bonologies that we need. So now we finally arrive to the symbolic dynamical result in the talk, and that is, that if you have a SPR surface diffeomorphism, then it has a symbolic coding which has spectral gap. So that the countable Markov shift has spectral gap. And the proof is as follows. You take the coding in the lemma, the, the coding which gives you compatible bonologies, and you try to check the criterion that the entropy at infinity is smaller than the full topological entropy. So here is the entropy at infinity above, okay, on the symbolic model. This is this expression. Since projection preserves entropy, this limb soup is equal to this limb soup, okay? Mu and the projection of mu have the same entropy because pi is bounded to one, almost surely, finite to one, almost surely. Because of compatibility of bonologies, if mu tends to infinity above, then the projection of mu uh, tends to infinity below with respect to the passing bonology, okay? That's compatibility of bonologies. So this limb soup is smaller than this limb soup. Uh, because every sequence that contributes to this limb soup projects to a sequence which contributes to this limb soup. Now, by the SPR property from Sylvain Stock, this limb soup is less than the full topological entropy of the diffeomorphism. And because pi is finite to one, the topological entropy of the diffeomorphism is the Gorevich entropy of the symbolic model because every measure lifts to a measure with the same entropy above. So you get that the entropy at infinity of the symbolic system is strictly smaller than its Gorevich entropy. And this implies spectral gap. Okay, by, uh, by the result I mentioned before. So now we finish the circle. We saw that uh, if you have a general C infinity surface diffeomorphism, then it has entropy continuity of Lapin of exponents. This implies the strong positive recurrence. And this implies an existence of a, a symbolic coding whose transition matrix acts with spectral gap on a suitable Banach space. And now you apply the, uh, the classical results of uh, Ruel, Parry, Polycott, Sharp, Givarch and Hardy, uh, Rousseau Egel, Baladi, uh, Sebastian Guezel, and you get exponential mixing, CLT, almost sure invariance principle, and basically everything else that, uh, that you want. And uh, with this, I will thank you for your attention. Okay.
Thank you very much, Ramlin. Thank you very much for this wonderful, really wonderful, inspiring talk with, Thank you. That with so much, so much material now. <laughs> really yeah, I'm that. sorry about that. That's okay. Fortunately, oh. we have the YouTube video. So are there any questions? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, we go back yeah. to that slide where you had all the actual implications, not the diagram, but the actual theorem, uh, two slides back, I think. This one? Right, that, that one, yeah. yeah. So your coding, you, you need a special kind of coding. Is the one that you produce with your Markov, uh, you know, the, the way you, you prove the symbolic existence different from this coding? I mean, does no. this really... Rec it's the same. Oh, it's the same. Okay. It's the same. It's the same. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So in well, other words, uh, the, 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 just one quick, uh, so the extension of the Bowen technique of using Markov partitions basically always produces this kind of thing. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. That's Thank absolutely you. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The okay. reason is, the reason is that uh, uh, my coding, okay, now, now I speak to the people who, who attended the Yuri's talk, uh, a partition set in the symbolic coding um, corresponds to uh, points which are shadowed by epsilon chains with a fixed symbol. Now, if you fix the zero, zero symbol, then you get information, not just on the arbitrary location, not, not only on the location of the point, but also on the rough direction of the oscillated spaces and also on the rough rates of contraction and expansion along the stable and unstable spaces. The coding contains information, not just on the location of the point, but also on the hyperbolic features of the point. Oh, good. For this reason, partition sets in our codings are automatically subsets of passing sets. And this is the reason there is a connection between escaping cylinders on the coding and escaping passing sets on the manifold. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you, Sheldon. I actually had that exact same question. So know. thank you. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so it's uh, a joint question. Yes. Right? <laughs> uh, Vaughn. Yeah, I have a question about one of the applications you mentioned, Omri, in the, mm -hmm. in the very first section. Actually, at the very end of that section, the results section, you stated this result that if a measure is almost maximal entropy, then it's close in terms of integrals and the applet of exponents. That's right. Um, I wonder if there's uh, some kind of finite time version of this. If I think about periodic orbit measures, they're zero entropy, but of course they equidistribute. Uh, um, and, and they carry some complexity up to a certain finite time after which you no longer see it. Is there any corresponding statement for that? Uh, that's a very, very uh, penetrating question. You are right. If you want to, to get uh, quantitative results for equidistribution of periodic orbits, you have to do exactly what you say. You have to work not with, uh, not necessarily with the measures of high entropy, but with maybe even with atomic measures which approximate the measure of maximal entropy. And the answer mm -hmm. is this: uh, for subsets of finite type, the, the uh, result of Kadyrov uh, gives you something like this. It, it gives okay. it has a finitary version, okay. where uh, uh, what you have here is not the metric entropy but I don't know how to say this in, in words, not lower script H, but capital H for uh -huh. a partition, okay? So okay. Uh, this is true for subsets of finite type. For countable Markov shifts, we don't know how to do this. Is it a case that there's some sort of clear obstacle that must be overcome or is it the case uh, that no yeah. one's done it yet? There, there is an obstacle to the method of the proof okay. uh, so I, and the obstacle is that Kadyrov uses a very specific Banach space uh, where you have spectral gap. Uh, his Banach space is a Banach space where a, a convergence norm implies uniform convergence on the entire space. And that's very important for his proof. For countable Markov shifts, you can't have such a space. You can only require a uniform convergence on cylinders. You cannot require uniform convergence on the entire space because it's simply not true sometimes. Uh, so this is an obstacle in the method of the proof, which prevents uh, Rene and me from getting the finitary version of the inequality that that that, uh, that you mean. Uh, maybe a more clever proof can give it. I don't know. But, but there is sort of a clear obstruction. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we tried and we couldn't. Okay. 
I think Yasha had a question. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, it's kind of a more, I don't know, it's more general and more, I don't know, maybe a little bit philosophical uh, that uh, the results about uh, measures of maximal entropy uh, for example, my paper with uh, Sam Senti and Kerzhenk, which also mm -hmm. so shows exist that measure of maximal entropy has exponential decay of correlation under some other say, in, in, in a different settings. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the other hand, there are a number of results that show that for um, smooth measures, uh, uh, outside of uniform hyperbolicity, you should expect polynomial decay of correlations. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my uh, question is that, and in fact, if you connect, if you uh, consider the geometric potential and you connect a uh, measure of maximal entropy to uh, Lebesgue measure uh, uh, through the parameter T in the geometric potential, then uh, all uh, equilibrium measures corresponding to different T will also have I mean, known results show that uh, there are situations and all, they all have exponential of correlation, which breaks down exactly at the Lebesgue measure. So mm -hmm. my question is that, first of all, can, do you believe that your result may be extended to um, er, uh, equilibrium measures in the two-dimensional cases of C infinity diffeomorphism, showing they, they all, except T is equal to one, uh, have uh, exponential decay of correlation, and uh, whether for t is equal to one, it will it, um, uh, basically you should expect polynomial decay of correlation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a speculative question, of course, but uh, no, no, it's it's again a very good question. Um, I talked about a strong positive recurrence condition for the transition matrix. There is a notion of strong positive recurrence for potentials where we generalize the notion for matrices by basically strong positive recurrence of the zero potential or the constant potential corresponds to the strong positive recurrence which I discussed uh, today. But you can also talk about strong positive recurrence of other potentials. And this property is a stable property. So it follows from what I said today that uh, for very small t, for t close to zero, t times the uh, geometric potential is going to be strongly positively mm -hmm. recurrent and its equilibrium measure will have exponential decay of correlations. However, this is a perturbative result and it's only going right. to work for t very, very small. Now, when you move to t closer to one, uh, there are counterexamples. For example, Payman uh, 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 Islami discussed or men uh, mentioned in his, in his talk uh, an example due to Martens and Liverani of a Hamiltonian system, which preserves the Lebesgue measure, is C infinity as far as I understand, and has um, a sub-exponential decay of correlations. So this is going to be an example which shows that uh, for t equals one, sometimes you're not going to have the strong positive uh, uh, recurrent uh, property. Um, now, can I answer in a, on, a, on a heuristic level, what is the difference between the constant potential and the geometric potential, not really except to say that the uh, geometric potential is more complicated than the constant potential. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, th there, is a, there, is a, there is a subtle difficulty that uh, you have to fight, not really fight, you have to avoid because you can't fight against it, it wins all the time. This difficulty is that the continuity, the, uh, what Jerome called the entropy continuity was a, a statement about weak star convergence on the manifold. Whereas in order to use thermodynamic formalism for countable Markov shifts, you need continuity with respect to weak star convergence in symbolic space. These are very, very different conditions. And um, the constant potential has the wonderful property that it's continuous both above and below. And therefore it behaves well for weak star convergence with respect to the original topology and for weak star convergence with respect to the symbolic topology. The geometric potential is, doesn't behave well for both uh, topologies because it's discontinuous on the manifold. It's continuous above, but it is continuous on the manifold. So uh, the analogous result for entropy continuity for the geometric potential uh, is much more difficult. Indeed, it's, it's not true in general, 
precisely because it's, you know, it, it doesn't play well with weak star convergence on the manifold because the potential is not continuous on the manifold. I don't know if I, if I answer. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, I mean, I understand what you're saying. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Snail. All right, thank you. So I have a couple of uh, questions on me. So mm -hmm. to understand the scheme of, uh, of your proof, you start with showing first that for, let's say, topologically transitive surface deformorphism, you can found a monoclinic class with high entropy on which the coding is transitive. And then you can apply your methods for transitive shifts, but there could still be other homoclinic classes on the manifold, even in transitive case or mixing case. So let me ask the following. Let's, let's call an MME local MME. If it is a supremum over some homoclinic class, do your results apply to those local MMEs as well? Yes. Yes. Okay. So our results apply to uh, homoclinic classes, to measures of maximum entropy on homoclinic classes. Uh, one of the differences between the C infinity case and the CR case is that in the C infinity case, uh, we proved with the, I mean, uh, Jerome Sylvain and I proved that uh, there are only finitely many homoclinic classes with entropy bigger than a constant. What uh, is the constant? Any constant. You, you take any constant, mm -hmm. uh, there are only finitely many homoclinic classes with entropy bigger than that constant. Okay. Uh, but in the CR case, you can have infinitely many homoclinic uh, classes where the topological entropy, you know, it, it keeps growing without ever achieving a maximum. And each one of them would have... Um, each one of them, you would have a local uh, measure of maximal entropy, maybe. Yeah. Okay. You may have, a, on some of them, you may have a, 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 a local measures of maximal entropy without the diffeomorphism itself having a, a global measure of maximal entropy. Okay, so, so that's what I'm trying to say. Can you tailor it so you find a homoclinic class which carries an SRB, but also carries a local MME. So you can say that uh, de facto the, the SRB is coded on a transitive coding where the, the, the entropy is uh, with a spectral gap property. Assuming in advance that there is an SRB. Assuming in advance that you have an SRB. Yes. Okay, that's wonderful. Yes. But what I, what, I, what I don't know is, uh, uh, I don't know how to do it in such a way that the SRB is a uh, SPR, in fact, there are oh, examples yes, when it's, it's not always true. Yeah, yes. yeah it's not okay. always true. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't want, I don't know a condition, to, uh, what condition to put, to force it to be true. Um, okay, well, so I have one more heuristic question. Let's forget for a second about your coding that you constructed. Is it true that for whichever coding that you code, an um, MME it will have to have a spectral gap property? Uh, wow, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I would expect not, uh, because I, I I can think of many ways of spoiling a coding, but uh, I, I don't have an example. In okay, mind. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Snail. Wilton? Uh, let me put uh, in some uh, scenarios. Suppose that you have a, a induced map, a full Markov map, Suppose for a, maybe a compact in Riemann manifold, a, a, a smooth map, and suppose that you look for the, the set of all uh, invariant probability that can be lifted to this uh, induced map, okay? And so suppose that uh, this is a, a very good uh, uh, induced map, uh, every element go through all the, the have full uh, image. And the, the question is, suppose that you have a, 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 lift, a liftable uh, measure that has maximal uh, entropy between these, all the lift, liftable measure to this induced map, okay? So, uh, and uh, suppose that, uh, so I, I want to relate the, the your condition that a measure goes to infinite to, to this kind of scenario. And uh, uh, look, uh, you can think that, uh, about uh, if you have a sequence of uh, a liftable measure, maybe the sequence goes to uh, uh, 
uh, does not converge to a liftable one. So, in, but suppose now that all uh, measure, liftable measure with big enough entropy, uh, uh, the, the, the limits convert to a liftable one. So in this case, you can uh, uh, conclude the, the spec of the gap to this induced map that is to in, in, did you understand my question? Um, I think the answer is okay. So you have like the, the, the closure of all liftable measure. And suppose uh, that <coughs> this closure is, uh, uh, this is a compact set. So, and suppose that uh, the, the, the measure that maximize the entropy in this uh, closed uh, set is uh, a liftable one. What is good? Yeah. So, so um, I always have this problem because you know different people when they they say induced map they mean a different thing, different things. Um, I get power for for instance. Uh, so you see the the problem is that the induced map if if you mean the first return map to the base of the tower, it's usually a, a system with infinite topological entropy. So um, everything that I will say will will collapse because. Uh, there are many, many measures for the induced map on, on the base of the tower, which have a maximum entropy because the maximum entropy is infinite. Um, yes, but I'm looking for only the, the, the set of measures that can be liftable and you can go down again. That the, 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 the still, 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 I think that uh, the, the induced map will have uh, infinite topological entropy. Um, yes. The that, also, yes. I'd like to say another thing. I'd like to say another thing. Um, you could have situations. These are the so-called null recurrent uh, situation, or even or even transient situations, when uh, you look at the induced map. It has, in order to avoid the problems of infinite topological entropy, let's talk about equilibrium measures of potentials. Okay, the pressure could be finite if the if the potential is unbounded from below. You could have situations when the induced map has an equilibrium measure, but uh, when you try to lift it, you either get an infinite measure or you get a measure which is less than the, what the pressure should be. Um, and so I think that it is difficult to pass from conditions on strong positive recurrence of an induced map to conditions on strong positive recurrence of the original map, at least the way that I uh, that I do it. You, you understand yes. what I mean? Um, yes. Yes. It's difficult. It's difficult to, to do it like that. Okay. So actually, I have we we're a bit over time, but if uh, Agnieszka doesn't mind, we will take another few minutes because I have a actually a comment slash question which I would like to. To say so, Omni, can you go to the beginning to again to where you talked about the maximal the optimal pacing constant uh, right at the beginning in the in the uh, statement of results? There yes. we go. The next slide when you talk about the the result here, yes, your result. So um, this reminds me of some old work that actually uh, I did with Wilton and. Uh, and uh, Jose, with Wilton mm -hmm. and Jose Alves, in, in the context of uh, non-uniformly expanding maps, um, in which basically we proved the kind of converse, or we studied at least the converse um, result of this, right? So it, the, the definition of K was not exactly this, but morally we mm -hmm. asked, okay, suppose that this, this tail of this, of this Pacing constant decays at a certain rate, polynomial, stretched exponential, exponential. Does that imply that the system has uh, a corresponding decay of correlations? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we proved uh, it's like this critical set. Uh... Well, no, the 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 day it was really like this. It was the mm -hmm. the way we define it was the hyperbolic the first hyperbolic time, right? Mm -hmm, Which is mm -hmm. more or less this pacing constant. So you almost every point has a has a time which it takes 
you know, which is like the first hyperbolic time, which is basically this, this constant. And then you look at exactly this, this tail that you've got here, right? The measure of the set of points where this constant is bigger than N, mm -hmm. for example. And you look at how fast this goes to zero. Mm -hmm. Just like you've got. Okay. Yeah, and, I and I didn't know. I will look it up. I yeah, I, I can send you. But this is in the in the non-uniformly expand, expanding case. And the thing is, the reason why I, I wanted to mention it is because we were not able to solve every case. So we we were able to show it in the polynomial and stretched exponential case, mm -hmm. but we never we never actually managed. As far as I can remember, I don't know, this is 15 years ago. So maybe Wilton or Zach and but I, I think we, we never managed to crack the exponential case somehow because we were doing some estimates where we lost mm -hmm. you know some optimality. And so I think mm -hmm. the reason I wanted to mention it is because I think it's a still an interesting open problem. You know, if any anybody here is uh, is interested, I just wanted to mention it. So and, and also I wanted to ask you if you think in this context, because we did in the non-uniformly expanding case. So of course it would be interesting to look at it in the non-uniformly hyperbolic case as to whether, you know, whether you can go, you can prove some kind of converse. So suppose, suppose that you satisfy this exponential thing. Does this imply that you have exponential decay of correlations? Mm -hmm. for this I, I, th I think the answer is yes. Right. I think the answer is yes, because the optimal passing constant let me say it in the following way. Uh, every countable Markov shift, Markov partition, gives you a first return Young tower. Yes. Uh, you build on uh, the base of the tower is going to be a partition set. Yes. And um, okay, now what I'm saying is not written down, but I think it's true. Maybe I'm wrong. Is it recorded? <laughs> Yes, unfortunately, it is. Anyway, it's too, you can, you can too late. Too late. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think that I think that if you if you view the uh, countable Markov partition as a Young tower over a partition set, then you can relate the tail of the optimal passing constant to the tail of the first return time. Right, that was our approach. And, also. Yeah, I think I think it's true under fairly general circumstances, and I think that then you can use the uh, I mean, the, by now, well-developed techniques of uh, relating the tail of the return time of the Young Tower to the rate of the curve correlations. So, do you, so, so, so that, yeah. But on the other hand, this uh, this uh, Young Tower that you construct from the Markov partition, it does not depend on the measure, right? But my condition ah, but the, on the tail, the condition ah, on the, the tail, tail of the yes, the, the condition tail of the tail the, depends on the measure. Right, right. So, do you think that what you just said might apply for the SRB measure as well? No, 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 not in the level of generality that work because of the counterexamples of, uh, for example, uh, it was discussed in Payman uh, Islamist talk. So, so um, for you, Martin Sliverani, I mean, there are examples of C infinity diffeomorphisms uh, which preserve the volume, which are not exponentially mixing. No, 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 that's not what I meant. I meant that if, if yes, but you can still. Uh, you can still ask this question for polynomial mixing. So if the if the tail of the optimal passing constant decays polynomially, in that case, you know you could. Uh, I mean, the relation uh, could be the relation could apply for different rates, not necessarily just. I see. I see. Uh, yes, there is chance that it's true. I think okay. there is a, there is a big chance that okay. it's true. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we've gone way way overboard. I'm sorry. Agnieszka and everyone. So let's take a uh, six minute break and uh, start again with, uh, thank you very much Omri, first of all. Thank oh, you. Thank you.